Hello again, time for another Navy chat and in this Navy chat we will cover the questions from the first two Navy chats and as always welcome Justin. Uh, hello, happy to be here. I hope this Navy chat won't be mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, YouTube comments, they never get old. <laughs> Let's begin with the first question from Lawful Neutral. Could you ask Justin about the information sharing between the Western powers during the period in regards to the IGN? Um, I can't provide like a, uh, a great uh, amount of detail on this subject, but I can certainly say that cooperation did exist. And in fact, this cooperation existed even with countries that were uh, not necessarily on the greatest of terms uh, diplomatically. Uh, and they kind of cooperate to varying degrees uh, regarding intelligence on Japan. Uh, because, of course, there wasn't really anything to, to lose by information sharing uh, if the power in question wasn't, you know, allied to you. Obviously, once Germany, Italy, and Japan started to cozy up, uh, they stopped helping. But for most of the interwar period, there was an awful lot of cooperation. Or a surprising amount, I should say. Uh, one example I saw was a request for the opinions of several Western naval attaches. Uh, I can't remember what one. I think it was like it, uh, the Italian... German, the Soviet, and the British and the French, if I remember correctly. The American naval attaché asked all of them uh, to kind of give their their opinions of what the capabilities of the rumored new Japanese battleships that were then under construction uh, would be, uh, what, what their capabilities would be. Uh, of course, this class was the uh, Yamato class. Uh, each attaché provided their own opinion of its capabilities, so what they thought its uh, uh, gun caliber would be, uh, its tonnage, speed, etc. Uh, the American naval attaché then kind of put this all into a big report and passed it back to uh, Washington. So that's, of course, uh, one very notable example of all pretty much all the Western naval attaches coming together and sharing the information they had on a specific issue regarding the Japanese Navy. Now, most of the cooperation in the interwar period, intelligence-wise, was between the British and the Americans, probably, you know, not surprising to anyone, really. Uh, a lot of reports, and I mean a lot of them, uh, probably, I want to say, like, a, a very, like, maybe in the 40% or higher range of reports, typically were British in origin. And there, I'm assuming that was both ways. I haven't looked at the British records, but... I'm pretty sure it, it worked both ways. The two powers had actually such close intelligence ties regarding Japan that scholars often discussed them together as the, uh, quote, Anglo-American uh, assessment of Japanese capabilities. So there was an awful lot of exchange. RiceBull01 asks, On the subject at hand, wouldn't the US have gotten some intel on various pre-war IGN ships that were built in Britain? The Congo class comes notably to mind as they were designed and built by the British. Although heavily upgraded before and throughout the war, going from a battlecruiser to a proper, if lightly armored, battleship. Uh, yeah. The Americans had pretty good intelligence regarding the capabilities of uh, Japan's battle line as it existed around the time of the Washington Naval Conference, you know, 1921 22. I can't tell you if the, the British gave them the intelligence, but the Americans had a, a pretty good idea. You know, they knew tonnages, they knew speed, you know, armaments. They'd had some tours of warships around this time, so they even had kind of internal layouts for some. You know, various other characteristics, uh, with, they, had, they were reasonably accurate. Uh, however, once the Japanese started to reconstruct their vessels, the Americans didn't do the best job keeping up. Uh, by the time World War II rolled around, the American estimate of their capability was not the best. It wasn't um, terrible, but things like uh, the new speed of the Congo class uh, post-reconstructions uh, was unknown. They assumed uh, still that they went to 26 knots, if I'm remembering correctly, when their new speed was in fact 30, and I don't believe they figured out that the new speed was 30 until uh, in the middle of the Guadalcanal campaign. When they did math and figured out that uh, the Congo class, they were, they were coming up the slot and then going back down far faster than they thought they were capable of doing. Uh, on the other hand, the Americans never really understood the capabilities of the uh, Nagato class uh, very well. Uh, they badly underestimated its speed uh, until its post-reconstruction trials, ironically, uh, where the U.S. used signals intelligence to pick up 
that they went 25 knots post-reconstruction. In fact, as built, the Nagato class went 26.5 knots, but the Americans had always assumed they were far slower, I think around the 23 knot range. So they had a bit of a, uh, a minor freakout when the 25 knot figure came up. And it's one of the main uh, motivators for why they increased the speed requirement for or North Carolina and South Dakota, I should say. Uh, the Iowas were built to counter the Kongo. The Americans underestimated tonnage of the Japanese battle line uh, as pretty much across the board because they were assuming the tonnage as built uh, without all the stuff the Japanese had added to them during the interwar period. So, you know, having that information of, of what the capabilities of the ships were, you know, say in 1920, 21, 22, where the ships hadn't been really reconstructed yet, that information was good. But then, you know, by the time you get to 1938, 39, 40, uh, that information is badly dated. So basically, they didn't got the update memo. <laughs> yeah, it was it was hard to determine their uh, their capabilities because and, and and you know I don't want to poo poo the Americans too hard in this regard because for the most part you know their their errors were very you know like tonnages and things like that can be a very rough indicator of capability but they were battleships the Americans understood how they worked and for the most part, how the Japanese would use them and things like that. So it wasn't a, a critical error, per se. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, as you mentioned before, they focused on the strategic side and they knew, okay, the Japanese can't win a strategic or a long war. And so they didn't really have much money, I think, in the Navy and didn't care too much about the technical capabilities. So I think it's a, a mixture between we don't have the resources, so why should we focus on that? So, DRM GSR 0, whatever that means, asks the following question. What was the effect of Kantai Kesen, aka the prevailing school of thought in the IGN by World War II, on the IGN doctrine? I know that it affected how they used submarines, but how exactly did it affect the IGN doctrine? Uh, yeah, this is a pretty huge question. Well, um, uh, in short, <laughs> it impacted everything. Uh, the focus on a Mahanian style uh, decisive battle uh, kind of dictated what capabilities the Japanese Navy's uh, warships would need, their doctrine, their tactics. For example, the, the Japanese Navy badly neglected its uh, long, uh, long range logistical capability because it assumed it would be operating on interior lines uh, within their defensive perimeter as per the decisive battle and attrition operations that they uh, spent pretty much 20 years planning. Hence why there was so much uh, angst around trying to develop uh, underway refueling for the Pearl Harbor operation because it was a capability the Japanese Navy had never bothered with because under their assumption of a decisive battle and attrition operations they wouldn't have required underway refueling. Uh, they also badly neglected things like anti-submarine warfare, of course, uh, because the Navy was focused on crushing the United States Navy quickly and then coming to a settlement. And of course, in that case, that meant that the vulnerability of Japan's sea lines of communication wouldn't become a major issue. Uh, so yeah, the, that, that really had a, uh, an extremely strong impact on pretty much everything uh, that the Japanese Navy did. So this basically also affected to a large part also the target priority list for the attack on Pearl Harbor with focusing mostly on the battleships. Uh, yeah, in a sense. Uh, the Japanese Navy was one of the main proponents of Mahan's theories that he put forward in his, uh, his book, the, the Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Well, I would recommend reading at least the introduction, which apparently actually the publisher forced on him, uh, and it's by far the most important part of the book. The introduction is kind of like, in, in a way, uh, the naval version of On War. The Japanese really, really, really liked it. They translated it very quickly, and the Navy became extremely obsessed with it, uh, and kind of dragged that influence all the way into the Second World War. They weren't alone in that, but uh, the, their, their obsession with it was probably among the greatest. <laughs> the world at that point. Man. So then to the next question from Michael Austin. The Japanese also seem to have a mental blind spot in the design of weapon systems and doctrine. 
Japanese warships and aircraft focused almost exclusively on the offense and neglected defensive systems, such as an adequate damage control features for ships and training for crews and armor plate and self-sealing fuel tanks for aircraft as well as a completely inadequate pilot training program. My working hypothesis is that Japan's minimal participation in World War I helps to explain this. The major combatants had the World War I experience of a long, protracted war to guide technological and doctrinal development. Did you come across anything similar in your research? Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of truth uh, to this. There are also quite a, uh, quite a few misconceptions that spring from it. Uh, for example, very few people know this, but the Japanese Navy was actually deployed to its absolute limits during the First World War. Uh, throughout the entire length of the war, uh, Japanese destroyers actually spent more time at sea than British ones, for example. Uh, because Japan had to, you know, mine shop in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Uh, this included, you know, holding down British uh, possessions, conducting patrols in the Pacific for the USN after the USN, uh, or the US joined the war, uh, escorting Entente convoys to the Pacific and Indian Ocean to protect them from raiders, uh, and eventually even conducting anti-submarine warfare in the Mediterranean. Now, obviously, this wasn't glamorous work, uh, but it was all. But it was extremely useful experience, and the Japanese Navy threw this, you know, convoying and anti-submarine warfare experience uh, away in the interwar period. So they really don't have, you know, people always dismiss the Japanese Navy sucking in those areas uh, as, oh well, they, they they didn't get the experience, except they don't even have that excuse. In my view, they did get lots of that experience in the First World War and willfully just kind of threw it out uh, post-war, which I find pretty much inexcusable. I mean, even their, um, you know, Kantai Kisen, decisive battle, short war stuff, they really should have paid more attention to the valuable experience they gained during the First World War. Do you know why they did it? I mean, was it like the, was, was there a major exchange in leading personnel or something? For anti-submarine warfare experience, only a very... I can't even remember how many destroyers they sent to the Mediterranean. Not very many. So there was only a very small group within the Japanese Navy that gained anti-submarine warfare experience. And I don't think they've... It's, it's been a little while since I read exactly what happened. But um, it, it's very clear that the institution of the Japanese Navy pretty much dismissed the, the experience that those people that had been sailing around in the Mediterranean, uh, the, the experience they gained. And stuff like convoying and everything like that, I mean, this is not glamorous work. And it's why the, the, the Japanese Navy's contribution to the First World War has been almost entirely ignored outside of really a couple of articles, including one article that I'm s citing in my mind at the moment for this uh, explanation. Nobody really wants to focus on... On, when, you, when your entire navy is built out of uh, uh, on a on a base of like Mahan decisive battle and you know giant battle lines clashing and destroying each other in one climactic engagement, nobody really wants to take courses on escorting a convoy going you know six knots and oh there's a submarine over there so you better send a you know it was really really unglamorous. And the same same reason why the Japanese also badly neglected mine laying. Uh, I actually. <laughs> I, as an aside, I read a, an American intelligence report when they were touring a mine in torpedo school, where they like, they looked at like mine classes, and there was like there was like a couple officers in it, and they'd been forced into it by the navy out of a requirement because nobody wanted to study mine warfare. Yeah, there was a I think there was a very pretty in, strong institutional kind of dismissal of something as menial as anti-submarine warfare and everything like that, which is why the Japanese took an embarrassingly long period of time to even introduce basic measures. Yeah, it makes sense if you focus on completely on the military side and everything on the glory aspect. I mean, this is like logistics and all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, uh, that's, for, that's for the officials. Keep it away from the officers. <laughs> Yeah, it's far more when you're looking back as a as a Japanese naval officer in say 1938. You know, you don't look back to escorting a convoy through the Indian Ocean in 1915. You're looking at the Battle of Tsushima in 1905, where you know they destroyed an entire Russian fleet. You know, it's far more interesting and glorious. Now, uh, regarding aircraft, uh, which he also mentions, 
Uh, there's uh, there's quite a bit of nuance that's required, actually. I'll start by blowing some minds by stating that the majority of Japanese aircraft designs which fought during the Second World War actually had pilot and fuel tank protection. The Japanese Army Air Service was right up with the other major powers where pilot and fuel tank protection were concerned. In fact, in some areas, they were among world leaders. Uh, because they took the experience they gained in the war with China in the late 1930s to heart. So they went to war in China, they found out that there was they were taking a lot of losses, mainly because of a planes bursting into flames after taking a very small amount of damage, and they're like, well, we need to actually protect our aircraft. So every Japanese Army Air Service aircraft designed after the late 1930s uh, had at least the standard amount of protection seen in Europe or the U.S., or in some cases a little bit more. The Japanese Navy Air Service was a different story. Uh, they stressed a need for max the maximum amount of performance, particularly range. When self where self-sealing fuel tanks are concerned, you sacrifice quite a bit of range to add them, and the Japanese Navy had a, something of a range obsession. Uh, therefore, they decided to forego the added weight of pilot and fuel tank protection and also the reduced capacity of self-sealing fuel tanks on almost all of their early and mid-war designs. In fact, there's some designs, the B6N carrier attack aircraft, they developed it unprotected, then they added self-sealing tanks and the range dropped and they're like, oh, we don't want that, so then they eliminated the self-sealing tanks again. This was, despite their experience in China, clearly demonstrating the need for it. Uh, G3Ms uh, losses were quite high in China for a lot of reasons, but one of them was they, the Japanese were very aware that they had a tendency to burst into flames. This isn't to say that all IJNAS designs lacked protection. Uh, the H-8K was heavily protected, for example. It was actually the most, as a random tidbit, the, uh, the Americans deemed it the most difficult Axis aircraft to shoot down uh, out of, in either theater. It was, it was very large and very well protected. It was something that they didn't come across very often. But the, the, anyway, the Japanese Navy Air Service was very slow in recognizing the absolute need for protection. In fact, the Navy didn't really start going all in for it until 1944, and of course by that point they had bigger problems. In short, it was kind of a, a deliberate design choice by the Japanese Navy Air Service to stress range over protection, and I believe that was one choice that I believe was made in error. Uh, keep in mind that I'm talking about 1940-41 onwards. Stuff designed in the mid to late 1930s uh, gets a pass because protection was not standard anywhere at that point. Some aircraft had it, some didn't. You know, people tend to forget the Americans were still in the middle of phasing out unprotected aircraft in, in late 1941 and into 1942. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, the many variants of the 109 that fought in the Battle of Britain had no armor protection. It, it wasn't like this was some kind of crazy thing in, you know, 19... for aircraft designed in the late 1930s, or certainly the mid-1930s. However, where the Japanese Navy Air Service fell behind is those that crucial, you know, 1940 onward period, where they were insisting on omitting protection to maintain range. Uh, outside of maybe some of the most basic features, like uh, very few people know this, but the main version of the G4M1 that fought a lot in the Solomons actually did have fuel tank protection. Not full self-sealing fuel tanks, though, because that would have sacrificed too much range, but it had rubber lining and things like that. Of course, it didn't really help at any, and the thing had zero armor. So it got a reputation for bursting into flames and or pilots and crew being killed by fairly um, chance kind of strafes that weren't particularly accurate. But yeah, as far as, obviously this question can go also into the Japanese army, but that's an entirely <laughs> <laughs> different topic, yeah. That's a whole different can of worms, because where the whole World War I experience comes in is predominantly an, an army issue, which maybe we'll talk about someday, maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> in this regard, uh, it would be interesting, did the... The range bonus they got, did it actually work to their advantage, especially in the carrier battles? Not particularly. I mean, the, the Japanese Navy got what they wanted. They could outrange the American Navy. Uh, they could launch a strike force out to, I think, around 100 kilometers longer range, even in 1944. But of course, what happened in 1944? Well, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, where the Japanese, even though they outranged the Americans that could strike first, and indeed, that battle actually, uh, tactically, uh, the Japanese fought it extremely well. It's uh, from an officer, uh, you know, an admiral's perspective. 
the thing is, is it was like a complete debacle uh, mainly because they're you know air crews and things like that that we're not going to get into but it didn't really help all that much or something like the g the range on the g4m the g4m had a ludicrous operational range for a twin engine bomber if memory serves it had a longer operational range than a b17 but it was a twin engine bomber it was ludicrously long range but you know i would ask why you know it it, fa it far outranged its fighter escort which was you know not a not an unheard of problem of course but you know couldn't if couldn't you have sacrificed a little bit of that extreme range for protection uh, but the Japanese, they just wanted to maximize that range, and honestly, it really wasn't uh, worth it. I mean, Japanese army aircraft, they did just fine. And eventually, things like the Zero and all that did get protection, and of course, they lost some range, but, I mean, it didn't really impede their capability. Because, of course, you you were already talking about fighting an opponent that, you know, was already outranged by you, so maybe pairing it back a little bit like that, you'd get maybe, you know, rough parody, which is hardly some kind of catastrophe, but yeah, that, I, I really don't like that that design decision. You know, on the G3M, it's okay, because when it was designed, early, you know, mid-1930s, where it was pretty much standard to not have protection or anything like that, but the G4M, after all that experience in China of G3Ms bursting into flames and all that kind of stuff, and like, reports like, hey, we need more protection on these things, and then they go ahead and do the exact same uh, thing with un with a lack of protection again. That's for me personally. That that's a no go. What error did they make that they couldn't use like in midway the longer range of their carrier group? I mean, if I have more than one hundred kilometers of range, I should be able to hit the U.S. carriers at least once and then move away before I even get into range. So it was mainly a problem of reconnaissance. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things where it sounds great on paper, but in practice, you're not going to be able to. Um, it's the exact same. Uh, this was actually a uh, this outranging the enemy was actually an IGN uh, a doctrine for across the board. Their torpedoes, their guns, everything was built around this concept, including their aircraft. And you know, it sounds great on paper. Well, if our battleships can shoot farther than theirs, then we'll just kite them with our superior speed and just keep shooting them with longer range guns. Of course, in the real world, with yeah, the fog of uncertainty, as Clausewitz said, erroneously translated as fog of war, he, you know, this kind of ideal situation is, of course, not going to happen. You're maybe you're going to discover the enemy a little bit later, and they're already in range anyway, or maybe you get a strike off before they can, and it, they, all the aircraft gets slaughtered anyway, a la the, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, or. In terms of gun outranging with gun power, you I mean, know, with guns, I, I get it because the guns, the distance is pretty small, but mm -hmm. but like with 100 kilometers, I mean, even with in full speed, it's like three hours or something of a carrier group that and and that they, they need to catch up if mm -hmm. the one is standing still. So that's actually that's not so much time. <laughs> <laughs> It's just yeah, it's just one of those things where it sounded great on paper, but but in practice, you know, you discover the enemy fleet was already within their striking range. So maybe whatever. with perfect reconnaissance, it would have worked out. Yeah, yeah, like one of those things where if everything worked perfectly as you could draw it out on paper, uh, it was a great idea, and then in practice, uh, really didn't prove to be the kind of decisive uh, fact that. They had a hoped. So in a computer game, it would be a killer, but in real life, it was just. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's like a little footnote, like, oh, they they could outrange an American carrier strike force by around 100 kilometers, even by 1944. It's like, okay, well, in 1944, they were getting slaughtered anyway. So. Well, this concludes our Navy chat on your questions on the first two Navy chats, and thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, no problem. And I hope this wasn't mediocre. And <laughs> see you in the next Navy chat. Until next time. <laughs> Perfect outro. <laughs> yeah. So now we have at least two mediocre stuff. So <laughs> if one gets cut, we have the other one. <laughs> <laughs>